Awesome to welcome Denver Nuggets assistant coach John Beckett to the basketball podcast. Beckett initially joined the Denver Nuggets franchise during the 2016-17 season as the director of player development. Before his time in Denver, he worked for the Delaware 87ers and a nine-year tenure with the Atlanta Hawks, where he worked as the team's video coordinator and assisted with player development. This past season, the 2022-23 season, Beckett became an NBA champion as the Denver Nuggets won the NBA championship. JB, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, I'm excited to join. Well, excited to have you. Uh, I've seen you around practice doing all your things, and uh, it's great stuff and uh, quite the career as well. And uh, what a deal this year, winning an NBA championship. Tell us about that experience. Oh, man. Um, as you can imagine, it's uh, everything you, you've dreamed of, obviously. Uh, been into basketball, love basketball since about seventh grade on, and you know, you watch all those great Bulls teams, you watch all those Laker teams, and you see them win championships, you see the confetti come down, uh, you see the commissioner, uh, David Stern at the time, obviously now Adam Silver, up at the stage, and he's uh, giving the trophy to the champions. It's uh, something that brought me back to my childhood. Um, you know, the big thing for me during the championship, uh, I told everybody I wanted to get the game ball, so it was important that I got the game ball. So as soon as the buzzer uh, was over and KCP had the ball and in my mind, I was thinking he was going to just going to take the ball with him, but he threw it in the air. So once it got in the air, um, I went all out to get it. And, you know, luckily I was able to get it. And, you know, I have a keepsake from that game, from that championship run. And um, I'll always remember it. That's great. That's great. You uh, competed till the end and got the ball. That's beautiful to hear. Uh, Absolutely. Of course, your background is pretty diverse. Player development, video coordinator, and full assistant coach. Now, um, let's let's put your player development hat on a little bit as we talk initially here, and that's uh, maybe give us an idea how to teach and correct without much practice time, because that's definitely a challenge in the NBA life, isn't it? Yeah, very challenging. And uh, for us, uh, for me personally, I always feel like uh, the best teacher is experience, and obviously, if the guys aren't getting out there. Uh, the play, they're not getting a lot of that experience. So what we try to do uh, with player development is try to just break the game down. Um, if we know a guy, um, when he gets in the game, he's going to be involved in a lot of closeouts, we'll try to simulate that action. Uh, we'll try to simulate where we'll have multiple coaches on the floor, along with multiple players, um, and that player will be in a closeout situation. We will close out to him, um, and if he has the three, we want him to shoot the three. If he gets run off the line, uh, he gets to attack downhill. Now, from there, that's where the decision-making process comes in. We'll have another coach who what we call a low man come over, and we always tell him to do different things, sometimes be early, sometimes be late. Make that player make a decision. If he's late and he has a layup, maybe go for that. If he's late and he has a floater, go for that. If he comes over and he helps, uh, we usually have another coach who's in that sink spot, and we'll have another player on the opposite corner and on that wing. So now it's live. So that guy who's on the wing, what we like to call maybe a 45 cut, he might cut. Uh, they might stay just spaced out there and he might hit the guy on the wing and they could get a swing swing going or vice versa. He hits the wing and they hit it to the corner. Um, and that's just one of the things that we'll do to try to simulate as much game action um, as possible. Obviously, with Denver, we're, we're blessed with uh, young coaches, coaches that just got through playing. Uh, in the NBA, so they have the NBA size, they have athleticism, and they're able to simulate that type of size, that type of speed, that type of length closing out on them. Um, so we just try to just do that as much as possible. Obviously, if we play five on five, which we do do, uh, those guys might be in maybe three closeouts, four closeouts, whereas if we can break all these actions down, not, not only closeouts, but DHOs and pick and rolls, um, and you keep doing reps on reps on top of reps, we think, uh, and I think that's how guys will get a lot better. I, I love it. And, uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about the difference between doing on air, so unopposed, no decisions, versus what you're talking about, which is obviously adding the decisions. Obviously, you do a little bit of both, but uh, the priority is to, when you can develop players, stimulating decisions at the same time as skills, right? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times when uh, the coaches are the defenders, what we try to do is simulate how we feel the opposing team is going to guard them. If we know a guy is not a strong shooter, we know any type of DHOs, they're going to go underneath. 
So what we'll try to do is simulate us going underneath those DHOs. Now those guys have to figure out a way to still be effective. They go underneath, all right, let's go to a, to a step up then. Uh, if they go underneath, maybe those guys are just quick enough. They're able to get that angle on them and still able to get downhill, maybe to get a layup or if the defense collapse, they can get into a, a driving kick scenario. Uh, so everything that we do, we try to base it on how things would go in the game. Um, if a guy we know is a strong shooter, uh, we know that other teams want to get him off the line. Obviously, we want to work on his in-between game. We want to work on his decision-making once he gets into the paint and also work on his finishing at the same time as well. Um, we always feel like that's the best way for these guys uh, to get reps and to learn. And once we do that type of thing, a lot of times we have cameras set up in the gym. We can get film. So the next day we can you know, watch film with these guys, talk about uh, what they did well, what they did bad, what can, so improvements that we can look to make. And then we'll also look at guys on our team. Uh, KCP is a guy that he's involved in a lot of closeouts. He's involved in a lot of uh, DHO. So a lot of times if we show film, a lot of these guys aren't playing. So we'll show them guys on our team or maybe from the opposing team that we feel does a really good job and can help their game grow. It's, it's, it's awesome to hear. And uh, to, speaking of a player like KCP and that type of player who can shoot it or drive it, can you give us some insights in terms of how you develop the decision making specifically relative to shooting it or attacking closeouts? I mean, everybody is uh, different. You know, some guys have a quicker motion in their shooting. Uh, so if their motion is not maybe quick enough, we'll try to do things that help them prepare to get it off quicker. Uh, for us, if you have an open three, uh, we want those guys to take it. And then obviously, uh, if they do get run off the three-point line, we don't totally not want guys to not shoot mid-range jumpers, but we prefer that they either get to the basket or, you know, once they get to the basket, if they don't have that layup and the defense, you know, collapses on them, let's try to get to our drive and kick game. And I think that's similar uh, to what most teams want. Um, so, again, a lot of times it's just – getting those guys in the situation, getting those guys comfortable uh, to shoot the ball when they are open, even when they have uh, maybe an athletic guy that can bother their shot, they're able to get it off maybe a little bit quicker. And uh, we have some things that we do to help those guys with their shots and get it off quicker. A lot of times it's maybe just being prepared before the, the, the ball gets there, you know, having that shot prep, you know, your knees bent, showing your hands. Uh, some guys, you know, they have a, uh, a really long dip in their shot. Once they catch it, they bring it down low and bring it out. So sometimes we'll either try to eliminate the dip or try to uh, shorten it. Um, so we'll do different things to help those guys, uh, you know, get their shot off just a little bit quicker. And of course, a big change over, you know, the last many years is that instead of driving it, a lot of players will reset themselves and shoot the three versus a long closeout, right? And so talk to us a little bit about that technique and the different ways that you get them to be able to do that. Well, a lot of times, you know, I think it probably got popular more so with the Golden State guys. And obviously Steph Curry uh, leads that. They're really good at once they drive in the paint, we don't want guys to just stand there. Uh, we like for our guys to relocate. Uh, so we have a lot of drills where – uh, we have guys, we want them what we call touch the paint. Uh, so when you drive, drive the score. And then once the defenses collapse or the defense rotates, then you make your decision. So we do a lot of things where we have guys drive in the paint. We have guys on the perimeter moving as that drive is going, getting into their line of vision. So, you know, if the defense does collapse, you know, their teammates are there in an open area where they can complete that pass. And once that pass is complete, we don't want guys to stand. We want you to make that pass, and then we want you to relocate outside that three-point line. We want to continually uh, put that defense in those tough positions where they got to continue to rotate and rotate and rotate, and then hopefully you hope at some point there's a breakdown where you either get an open three-point shot or maybe uh, open layup at the basket. Well, and you reference off the ball. I mean, some of the different cues that maybe you use for players versus – relocating off the ball in terms of penetration reaction versus cutting when they have an advantage to the basket versus holding a spot. Are those mm -hmm. essentially the three different decisions they've got to figure out on the perimeter off of a drive? Absolutely. And, you know, you know, obviously like most teams right now, there's a lot of scrimmaging going on uh, in NBA gyms. And we just had an instance today where a player drove and two guys from the weak side cut. 
um, which is too much. Uh, so we're trying to work with guys on maybe reading that better. If you're maybe in that corner and you see that wing going to cut, all right, I'm going to go ahead and read it and maybe just get here to the open area where the guy can find me. Because a lot of times uh, after one of those guys cuts and if the defense sees that, you'll see two or three defenders react to that and they all collapse to him. And then that guy on the weak side who was in the corner, he might be wide open or vice versa. The guy from the corner cuts and the wing might be open. Um, yeah, so a lot of times, you know, teaching that, we tell our guys, if you can see the back of your guy's jersey, he's not paying attention yet, go ahead and cut. But again, a lot of it is just experience. Uh, a lot of it is just reps. It's just having a really good feel for the game. I think a lot of people talk about that, about the off the ball decision making and can we develop it as coaches? And you mentioned experience. That's a big part of it. And then the way that you guys practice with multiple coaches stimulating decisions is another way to do it. What are some other ways that we can develop players off the ball abilities? Uh, film study, uh, film study. Um, I think also understanding NBA defenses, uh, understanding your opponent, knowing what the opponent is trying to take away. Um, you know, a lot of teams uh, in the NBA, first and foremost, they're trying to take away the paint. So if they're trying to take away paint, understand that that weak side is always going to be in, in a shrink position, knowing that a lot of times it's hard to be in that shrink position, but also see your man that you're guarding. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, cutting is available um, because of because of that. Um, but again, it's just it's watching film and it's getting out there and playing. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of coaches that want to get involved with player development. And, you know, I try to tell them, man, the best way to get these guys better is obviously, you know, the one on one workouts, they're, they're, they're purposeful. Um, they can help. You can slow things down. You can talk guys through situations, talk them through techniques. But nothing uh, can prepare a guy uh, better than to me when you can break it down and you have a six, eight long athletic guy trying to block your shot and you have another long athletic guy coming from the weak side. Okay. What kind of finish can I get here? Or if I'm not able to make a finish, you know, do I have maybe a dump off pass to a big who's getting in front of the rim or I got the guy in the corner. So um, I think all those type of reps is just priceless. Talk to us a little bit about the difference then you mentioned one on reps. Talk to us about the difference because I think sometimes that's misconstrued when people watch, say, Steph Curry pregame and then they say, oh, you should be doing this as a player to develop. But talk yeah. to us about the difference between what they do pregame and then what they're doing in the situations that you've already described, because there is a difference in the goal, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, anyone that ever comes to a, a pregame for um, an NBA game, um, you'll see a lot of differences. If you come early enough, uh, most teams, they always have their rookies or first or second year guys always going first. And typically, you know, a lot of those guys who are not getting much playing time, you'll see them go, they'll go hard. Uh, we always preach game speed. You'll see those guys going at game speed, whether uh, they're doing, you know, live stuff versus coaches or one on one on oh, even if it's one on oh, um, we still, you know, want the little, the little details, you know, in their workouts, those details matter. Uh, for example, if we're working on pick and roll, I'm I'm really big on when you come off that pick and roll and that defender is being real physical with you, he's trying to send you that direction. Make sure you're bumping him, trying to run him into that screen because when you're coming off that pick and roll, the guy defending you, you should already be able to go ahead and beat him, uh, not only because he's getting knocked off with, with a screen because you also, you're also doing a great job uh, with your setup. Um, so the little details with that matter. And, you know, if you could, again, you come to those workouts, you'll see those younger guys going really hard, uh, working on game situations. Usually they're working on a lot of the shots that they will get in those NBA games. And then as time gets closer to game time, you'll see more of the rotation players, more of the starters come on the floor. And then for them, it's just getting a good, a good feel for the ball, getting a good feel for the arena, for the rims. Uh, just getting them feeling good, getting them loose just a little bit. They won't go as hard. Um, so you'll see a difference with those guys. But again, it'll always be with the details. Even if they're not going full speed, you know, look at the guy's footwork. Look at the guy when he comes off that pick and roll and he's getting the shot, how, you know, he's just not looking at the rim. He's imagining there's a roller coming. He's imagining what they're doing on the weak side if they're shrinking. If I have to pass, I can make to the corner or to the wing. And then they're getting into their shot. So even if it's one on one on old workouts, um, I think it's very important that you still just have those little details in there. So the guided defender 
uh, is the one that's stimulating a lot of defender uh, decisions. That's the coach generally. But in a lot of pregame stuff, it's obviously, as you referenced already, it's about comfort and confidence for the player, right? Making sure that they feel good going into the game. So you're not trying to stimulate mistakes. You're just trying to get them into the flow of the game. Is that the best way to be able to describe it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these guys do so much, even – you know, if you go to the, you know, a typical game day, these guys are coming in early in the morning, even before we have shoot around getting in shots. So even before they come to that uh, pregame shooting, they've already got up 100 and 150 shots already in the morning. Uh, and and not to mention that they just went through, uh, you know, the other the game plan, you know, scheming against how we're going to attack that team uh, offensively. What are we going to do defense? their special players, what adjustments that we might have to make. So um, for an NBA game, it's really an all day process. I love that. I mean, and that's one thing that maybe most people don't appreciate about how much obviously an NBA player commits to their development and their game. Is there anything else as kind of outsiders that we don't necessarily perceive that players go through that significantly improves them and helps them that maybe other players are not doing at younger levels or collegiate levels? And it's just, it's everything. It's, it's something, it's every day. Um, obviously, you know, we give guys at times days off, but it's, there's not very many. Um, even days where guys are beat up, like the veteran players, the, the rotation, the starter guys, and they might not be able to get on the court. They're always watching film. We'll watch film as a team, but those guys are also watching individual film uh, ways that they maybe can improve their game. Uh, whether it be on the offensive or def- defensive side of the floor. So uh, film is uh, very important. And when you watch film, you know, I don't know how guys watch film, but it's it's not just looking at stuff on the ball. It's looking at, you know, off the ball. It's looking at, you know, you know your shot selection. Is there a way that you maybe could have got a better shot, not only for yourself, but for your teammates? Defensively, are you in the right position? Are you rotating? Um, are you understanding, you know, a player's tendencies? Um, are you paying attention to the personnel? There's just so many things that guys can do that they can get better, not only just on the floor, but off the floor. There's the treatment, there's the massage, there's the ice. There's so much that guys do that, you know, you can always improve without a basketball. It's it's awesome. It's awesome to see their commitment to their craft. And uh, you Using your expertise here, one question I've always wanted to ask someone like you is to talk about different ways that players are able to leverage their advantage when they are dribbling. You see some players obviously use a leg lock. You some see some players use kind of an arm motion, a swim to try and mm-hmm. kind of leverage an advantage and keep that advantage as they're driving. Can you talk mm-hmm. about some of the different things that players do off the dribble to do that? Uh, I mean, off the dribble, um, these guys in the NBA are so talented, so athletic, so big and so strong. So, you know, everyone um, has their own way of creating these type of advantages. Um, you look at a guy like Jalen Brunson, who you know, might not be the, the fastest guy, uh, but he's so good at playing those angles. He's so good at using his body to, to create the separation. You know, I, I love watching him play. You know, anytime he's coming off pick and rolls, you know, I always tell, tell um, you know, our guards, you have to engage the big. You have to engage the weak side. So when he comes off, he's just not staring at the big. He's, you know, at the corner of his eye looking, seeing what that that roller is doing. He's looking to see what that weak side is doing. So he does, does such a really good job of setting guys up. And then once he gets into the paint, he never seems like he's in a rush. You know, he gets down there, he gives him a little bump, maybe get a step back. He gets down there, he plants off of two feet. Uh, uses a shot fake, gets the guy in the air, and he goes a little up and under, or he's able to get his fade away. Uh, Jamal Murray, one of our guys, is the same way. He's he's so big and so strong. You know, he gets downhill. Um, he knows how to use multiple uh, pivots. He's uh, such a good scorer, such a good shooter. He, If you are too aggressive, he knows how to use your aggression against you. Uh, he can beat you to the spot knowing that he sees you trying to catch up, trying to get a blocked shot. Next thing you know, there's a shot fake. You jump for it. You're able to recover. There comes another shot fake, and he's able to pivot and get a layup. So a lot of times with the player development, you know, we just try to work on different ways, like you mentioned, to get that advantage. And sometimes it's, you know, you know, a lot of guys, when they play defense, you know, the first thing they do when a guy drives, they like to stick that arm out there. So, you know, obviously it's become popular in a few years. As soon as that arm is out there, we teach guys, you know, get underneath using that swing through move. Uh, that James Harden made so popular or sometimes when they put that arm out 
you use your off arm that you're not dribbling with and you knock it down and that kind of gets the defender a little bit off balance with that. And then a lot of times if you're able just to get that little bit of step on those guys, you know, now try to veer into his path, not allowing him to get to get back in front of you. And then from there, you can make it to your own decision at the rim. Um, so we just try to teach all those different, you know, angles, all those different shot fakes and pivots that guys can use to create that type of advantage. And I want to connect something because you said at the beginning repetitions, but really what you were describing is repetitions without being repetitive because the situation can always change relative to what the coach does, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to get your opinion on Jamal Murray. You mentioned because you look at him and you go, he didn't just memorize a skill and then he goes and applies it. What he is, is incredibly adaptable, right? Like some of the shots that he shoot, I can't imagine that he has repped hundreds of thousands of time. It's just that he's so adaptable relative to the circumstances. Is, is that a fair assessment? Oh, it's definitely a fair assessment. I mean, you know, me and Jamal have worked together uh, since he's been in the NBA, since he's got drafted. And it wouldn't be true for me to just come here and tell you and say that, you know, I made Jamal, which I didn't. His dad uh, did an unbelievable job with Jamal. Um, I'm sure the stories is out there. You can read about all the different uh, techniques, you know, him and his dad used to improve his game. Um, I just feel like, you know, for me, with some of these guys, they're so talented, so good. I'm just trying to fine tune it. I'm trying to help these guys maybe, you know, you know, with Jamal, one of the main things, is, you know, if you ask him, I'm always on him about trying to get to the free throw line more. Uh, he does such a really good job, you know, with his shot fake. And you look around the league, guys who can get guys in the air, you look at uh, DeRozan, you look at a Trey Young, they're able to jump into them and get to the line. And they're so crafty with that. Jamal, it's hard because I want him to do that, but he's so good at, you know, once he gets a guy in the air using all those multiple pivots to get his shot off and, you know, he's very efficient with those shots. So it's trying to find a balance with that type of thing. But um, Jamal, um, as you mentioned, is just so good offensively. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we do uh, again, is just fine tuning. It's, you know, little improvements here and there. But in, in terms of like working on weaknesses with him, there's not very many weaknesses that he has. <laughs> but, but you are embracing the creativity with which he plays, right? That's that is a strength. Well, something you're doing is that you're well, not trying to fit him into a peg. You're saying go with this creativity, aren't you? So absolutely. Like you know, Jamal's workout is going to be a lot different than a lot of other guys' workouts because he's just so good and he's able to um, make. And, and complete shots that other people uh, just can't do. Um, or can't I, even I, think about it. Eh? Like, I think uh, you can't even envision it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I remember it was a good teaching point for me when we first got him. And, you know, I almost, I, I, I put him in a box. I was trying to, you know, make him, you know, do certain things like this type of player. And then, you know, as time goes by, you know, he's telling me, no, I could do more. And, you know, you start to see more. You start to see in games him doing more. And you're like, you know what? He's right. I'm, I'm putting him in the box. We need to expand this. We need to do, you know, tougher things. We need to be more creative. We need to work on those various runners like Steve Nash used to do. We need to work on more of his, you know, left-hand finishes or left-hand shot because he's capable of doing that. I mean, if you go in the gym, uh, he shoots with his left hand better than a lot of people shoot with their right. It's, it, it, it's unbelievable. Um, so, again, you like, uh, as you mentioned, you don't want to put any of these guys in the box. It's great stuff. And uh, obviously a big part of your success uh, with Denver has been these two and three player actions. So yeah. talk to us a little bit of it from a player development and assistant coaching perspective about how you can develop and embrace these two and three player actions between these teammates that obviously have such, such incredible synergy. Well, again, it's just a lot of live reps that we do. You know, I mentioned going against the coaches um, we call a lot of that stuff, you know, number, number V number, which is uh, either two V one. So it would be a two verse one or three verse two and, you know, et cetera. Uh, for example, today, uh, before we started uh, scrimmaging with the guys, you know, we did a lot of two V one, three V two work. And a lot of that stuff will be out of a lot of us, uh, the sets that we do. And it wasn't perfect. We have a lot of guys in the gym who were rookies, a lot of guys who just came into training camp with us for the first time. Um, so it wasn't perfect. It wasn't clean. Um, but those guys are trying. And then it's just one of those things that you continually do day after day after day. And then you start to see improvements from these guys. 
Uh, and then it goes back to, again, with the workouts, you know, throwing them in the PD workouts, even if it's one on one workouts, you know, uh, doing various finishes out of those sets, doing uh, various shots out of those sets, just so it gets those guys thinking, OK, these are the type of shots that I that I can get when we run this uh, play. These are the type of shots I can run. I can get when we run this play. So it's just getting them more comfortable with the offensive sets that we run. And when you're doing these 3v2, 2v thing, 2v1, they're not just stationary, right? They're moving and there's decision making out of these situations. Oh, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. They're, they're all out of our set. So it might be out of a set and we'll only use two two guys going against one coach right now. All right. Now we'll add a third player and we'll do another action. And there's three players going against two coaches. Or uh, when I say 3v2, there's usually three guys out there as well. But once we get the screening action, all that going, you should be able to get downhill and able to uh, score and do other things. And at Basketball Immersion, we've done these things for a long time. So I understand why. But explain to people why you remove one of the defenders. Uh, just because, you know, just how I explained earlier with the pick and roll, uh, I feel like when you come off the pick and roll, the guy guarding you, uh, if you have a good enough setup, you have a good enough screen, he should not be a factor. Um, so it's the same thing when we run our offense. You know, if you're running, you know, any off ball actions where they're coming off screens, your setup and that screen being set should be good enough where, you know, you either coming off and, and let's say he's very aggressive. He's chasing you over to the top of the screen uh, and you're able to get downhill. Uh, you should be able to get just uh, that one defender, let's say, who's guarding that big. And then your teammate who's the big roll into the hoop. We call that a 2v1 right there. So, you know, a lot of times we look at the guy who was guarding you. You should be good enough. Where you can go ahead and beat him. So it stimulates decision making and almost all good basketball actions create some type of advantage, particularly on the weak side of the floor. So a lot of this action, no doubt, is also working on that weak side two on one advantage potentially as well. Oh, absolutely. Because um, the weak side, that's that, that's very important. We think the key to a lot of defenses, most defense is going to be that weak side is going to be that low man. So, you know, we're talking a lot of offense, but a lot of times, too. Uh, again, we, we have coaches that are you know, really good players, so they're able to get out there and also play offense. So a lot of times we want to make those uh, same players that are playing offense play defense because uh, a lot of our schemes, a lot of our techniques, they have to work on that as well. And you can do drills, you can do shell drill, you can do closeouts. There's nothing like live play because, you know, as you know, there's going to be a lot of variables that come in, that come into play. Um, you know, you can script it and say you want to do this. This guy does this. But a lot of times it doesn't work like that. So, again, we want to put those guys in as many live situations, rep as much as possible. So, you know, if that situation does arrive, they know what to do. Or, you know, if they're in that situation with a teammate, they can talk it out and like, OK, remember this happened in practice. We can go ahead and do this. Yeah, it's not a, a dance recital where you can just memorize and regurgitate the uh, the routine, can you? That's no, a absolutely. good part. That makes it fun for you as a coach, I know as well. So in talking to some of your colleagues about you, obviously talk so highly of you and all the context that we just talked about. But one of the things that stood out is how good you are with players at helping them handle struggles or adversity or different things like that. That's mm. a huge part of your role, not just as a player development coach, but as an assistant as well, to be able mm. to connect and help players through those moments that aren't going as well. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I don't know what the right answer is to that. I just look at it if I was in their situation and, you know, if I was in their situation, I would just want a coach that, you know, talks, talks to me, that's upbeat, that stays in the gym with me. And, I think it goes a long way. I'm a guy who's very active. I love to get on the floor with the guys. So I'll get out there, play defense. I'll, you know, play one on one with the guys. I'll get into three on three games, five on five. Um, if they're not playing and they're doing extra conditioning, I'll jump in the conditioning with them. Um, if it's a time where you know it's an off day, you know, for the team, but the uh, the low minute guys have to come in and they got to do you know in the weight room, and it might be one or two guys. I'll jump in there with them. You know, and I'll try to keep the energy up. I'll try to be positive. Um, so I just try to be as positive as possible. Um, obviously, there's times where you have to get on guys. But I think the fact that, you know, you're out there, you're sweating with them. And we like to call that sweat equity. Um, I think that builds that relationship with those guys. And I think when you're out there working with them, I think that allows you to, you know, if that time comes and you have to be tough on them, you're able to do that. 
I, I'm not sure there's a right answer either, but that's as close as I could imagine, Coach. You, I think you nailed it. So that's wonderful. And uh, you know, Coach, we see trainers, and this isn't meant to knock on trainers, but we see trainers all the time online posting these on-air dribbling type drills that they're doing with mm -hmm. players. And yeah, there's a time and place for that. But talk to us about the next layer. You've already connected it within these decision-making situations. But to truly develop ball handling, the hard part is not necessarily hand to ball. It's the decision when you're dribbling, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, ball handling drills are fine. Uh, we do ball handling drills as well. I, I use them more as a warm up before we start the uh, workout. But again, I'm more with the live stuff. Uh, if a guy is not a person that really handles and pick and roll, but let's say he's someone that may be on the second side, he can be a, a pick and roll guy. So to work on the handles, we have him handle the ball more, have him involved more in pick and rolls, have him be more of the point guard where, you know, he's typically playing off the ball. Okay, today you're going to be the point guard. You're going to initiate the offense. You're going to have to make decisions uh, while you're being pressured. You're going to have to make decisions while you're getting downhill and you've got this big guy looking to block your shot and you got another guard that's trying to, you know, get into your handle and stuff like that. So, again, I think, you know, the best way to improve and handle is to actually work on your handle, handle the ball in those live situations. It seems obvious. But, yeah. you know, it, it just yeah. doesn't – I mean, the things that I give people credit, the creativity that they come up with with these different dribbling drills is pretty impressive. But it what is. you just said, it, you nailed it, right? You got to dribble mm -hmm. against a person to be able to get yeah. better at dribbling. Yes, absolutely. And I think dribbling drills are um, – they're, they're purposeful. You need them. Uh, helps you get comfortable with the ball. But um, I remember I go back to my days in Atlanta, uh, Jamal Crawford, probably one of the best ball handlers in NBA history. And he wasn't very good at dribbling drills. Um, couldn't do a lot of the two ball stuff, but when you put him out there with the ball and game action, he was, he was one of the best out there. I think he was famous for one of his quotes where he basically said, I get better at basketball by playing basketball in games. Yeah. And I'm like, I think we lost that point somewhat. And I, it's so great to have you connect that throughout this episode in terms of that. JB, players teach us a lot if we are open to learning from them. And uh, I, you've been around some players in your time in the NBA for sure. So let me first ask you maybe about, uh, let's start with Jokic. What's something you learned from watching Jokic or working with Jokic that uh, impacted your coaching? Um, just his routine. Uh, he stays with it, whether he's tired, uh, whether he played 40 minutes, it doesn't matter. He stays with his routine. Now, you know, he might shorten it, uh, you know, if he's really tired or something like that, but for the most part, his routine stays the same. And then what he works on, they're all shots that he gets in the game, uh, and from areas of the floor where, where he's going to take those shots. Uh, again, I mentioned it a lot of time. We have, you know, a great, a uh, group of young coaches, coaches in general, that just can get out there and um, challenge guys' shots and, you know, just make it difficult and try to simulate as many uh, game shots as possible. So he likes to get a lot of our guys um, who are the bigger coaches to challenge his shots, to really make him work. So uh, just his routine and his attention to detail um, is probably what I've uh, taken most from his workouts. How about from Jamal Murray? Man, Jamal, he's he's not as detailed as um as Nicola. You know, for him, what I what what I take from him is more so like, you know, just his like focus, um, his his ability to like know when he needs maybe extra work and when he doesn't. I mean, he's kind of a freak of nature, man. A lot of the stuff you know, he does might not be uh, things that I like him to do in terms of, you know, I want to work on more type of game type situations. But, you know, he's a guy that just stays with his routine and it's, you know, just a lot of spot shooting, uh, a lot of shooting off the dribble. And, you know, what he does, obviously it translates over because um, once the lights are bright, that's when that's when he's at his best. Crazy Jamal fact, but uh, Jamal attended Grand River Collegiate, which is my high school that I graduated from. So I guess oh, I'm definitely not the most famous basketball person from that school. So probably not. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. And grateful for that. Um, obviously, your time in Atlanta, you were around so many players when you, you kind of shared the list off air with me. I was blown away by that list. But uh, maybe uh, how about Kyle Korver? He just seems so unique in what his skill set was. Uh, same thing, attention to detail and, 
you know, most guys that I've worked with and that are like considered the shooters like Kyle Korver, uh, it's their pace. Uh, whether we're run, working off various screening type of actions, um, they don't come off, you know, half speed. They come off the speed that they're going in the game. Uh, even when we're just spot shooting them, the way that they're shot ready, the way that they're showing their hands, they're in shooting position. Uh, so just from him, it was just how prepared we, prepared he was. And, and again, another guy uh, that was great with his attention to detail. When you mentioned that earlier in the podcast about really focusing on improving a player's preparation to shoot more than the speed of their shot. Uh, mm -hmm. And imagine with Kyle Korver, that really stood out is how quickly he was able to get himself ready to shoot every time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, he was just always just prepared. And it's just the, like I said, the details. He knows when he's coming off the screening ash and he's a guy that, you know, the opposing team, they want to limit the separation. So anytime he's coming off the screen, he changes pace. So sometimes he'll come off really hard. Sometimes he'll do, you know, what I like to call the stop and go, come off really hard, stop on a dime. And um, probably like a lot of the younger, younger viewers, if they pay attention to basketball like that, they've seen Damian Lillard do it. Uh, another guy who comes off screens really hard and then they'll just stop and that defender's momentum is going so hard he just runs into him and then they're able to draw a foul Kyle was probably the one person that I seen do that and the only person I know that does it in a workout to work on it well and you mentioned that throughout the podcast about game speed and really what you mean by game speed is change of pace it's not always one speed right absolutely change of pace is is huge because uh, even if you're dribbling or if you're coming off the of screens, I feel like you're very easy to guard if you play at the same pace. But if you can keep that defense guessing, that makes you that much harder to guard. How about Joe Johnson? Man, Joe was one of the first guys that I ran out of drills to do with him. Uh, the guy loves to work, man. He's one of the hardest workers I've ever been around. And he's one of the most skilled basketball players I've ever been around. Six, eight, really good size, able to handle the ball. Um, you know, could score all three levels. Great touch on his floater. Mid-range was a really good shooter. And then the three ball, again, uh, was just as deadly from out there. So, you know, for him, he was a guy that challenged me in terms of, like, you know, coming up with uh, different drills, different ways to keep him engaged. Because, you know, he's like that kid in school who um, he's like, you know, just so, as, you know, he's accelerated more than his classmates. So, you know, if the if the schoolwork is, you know, not tough enough or doesn't challenge him, he kind of gets bored. So that's kind of how I look at uh, Joe Johnson. Wow, that's that's a great lesson for a coach, isn't it? To be around someone like that, that challenges you every day to come up with some things and could be just a unique, simple twist within something you've done already. Right. Oh, absolutely. Like I'm a guy that, you know, um, in a lot of our shooting drills, uh, we like to, you know, set the set the ceiling. Uh, you got to shoot 80 percent or better. So. If we're shooting mid-range shots or three-pointers, it's either five to six or 10 to 12. Guys who are not as strong as shooters, we might go 10 to 13, more, more, more of around the 70% range, so 10 to 13 or five to seven. Joe was the type of guy that, man, you make it five to five, you make it 10 to 10, like, no, there's no misses for you. You got you to gotta make all these shots. Very, very similar to uh, J Jamal Murray. Jamal is the same exact way. That's amazing to be around people like that. And then obviously the pros pro Al Horford. I mean, what a career he's had. And uh, he was with you in some of his early years in Atlanta, right? Yes. And uh, the same way now, obviously he's been in the league a very long time. And uh, what stands out with him, even when he you know, first got here as a rookie, was just his maturity and his professionalism. Um, I know his trainer right now, Daniel Towns from Atlanta, uh, who works him out in the off season and um, they do a great job uh, together, you know, I go and watch their workouts. And again, there's, there's attention to detail. There's no uh, uh, wasted, you know, time in terms of working on shots that he might not get in the game. Uh, they've done a lot of work on his three point, his three pointers. And if you look at the stats, you know, the last probably three to four seasons, his three point percentage has gotten better and better. Uh, so that's a credit to Al. That's a credit to his, to his trainer, uh, Daniel Towns. Those guys really get in the gym and really get after it. Well, and we talked about longevity, a credit to you for your longevity. And uh, maybe you can talk about it just briefly, because somewhat of a non-traditional start to your career in terms of coaching, uh, starting obviously in the TV side. So uh, how did that help you? And then uh, just a little bit of advice to coaches who are uh, trying to find their way. Man, I didn't even really start in the TV side. TV side, yeah, is a part of it. But uh, when I got through playing, uh, I played briefly overseas in Germany, very low level team, Bergheim Bandits. I don't even know if they're around. If they are, shout out to them. 
But uh, started uh, over there, uh, came back, and uh, the overseas experience wasn't what I expected it to be. Didn't know what what to do. Um, the gym that I was working out at at the time, um, one of the guys who went to the gym, uh, he knew someone that worked in the Hawks, and he knew what I was, you know, kind of in between jobs, not knowing what to do. And he set up an interview with the guy. So I went down to the Hawks offices, which at the time were at the CNN Center. Uh, me and um, – that, that Hawks worker, we had a really good talk. Uh, next thing you know, he offered me a job in ticket sales. So <laughs> I actually started out in ticket sales, selling full full season packages, uh, mid-season, Chick-fil-A family nights. Uh, and that's how I got started uh, in the business. And once I started working there, um, anytime the team was on the road, we would play pickup at the practice facility. At the time, the Hawks practice facility was you know very similar to what we have in Denver. It was in the arena. So once work was over, we would go down there and we would play. Uh, got to know the video coordinator down there, Luke Steele. At the time, I didn't know what a video coordinator was. So, um, you know, we, I gradually started to learn more and more about what their responsibilities is. And, you know, basically the video coordinator is kind of like an entry level position for guys like myself who uh, never played in the NBA. Um, so I became interested. So I talked to Luke and I was like, look, you know, I have responsibilities during the games with my ticket sales, but anytime you have any downtime, I would like to, you know, come in here, just shadow you, see what you do. And, you know, luckily for me, he was uh, very gracious about that, very helpful. So uh, during my downtime, I would always come there and always just sit there and watch. Um, and then I started becoming interested in that side of the business. So anytime I would see, you know, the general manager at the time was Billy Knight, assistant general manager was Chris Grant. Uh, who went on to be uh, assistant in Cleveland and, and then eventually the head GM there, um, I would just tell them, you know, I'm interested. I want to want to be involved on the basketball operations side. I talked to them. I talked to scouts, the secretary. I don't care who it was. I was trying to let them know what I was trying to do. Uh, luckily, uh, at the end of the season, a position came open to be Luke's assistant. They offered me the job and been there, ever, been there, been in the league ever since, going on my 20th year. But um, the TV side was a big part of it as well, because a lot of times uh, as the assistant video coordinator, I didn't travel a lot. So anytime the team would go on the road, uh, I would go over and work on um, inside the NBA. Uh, working over there was a great experience being around Kenny, being around Charles. At that time, Shaq was still playing, so he wasn't there. And from there, I just you know moved up the ranks similar to you know how I did with the Hawks and the Nuggets. Uh, started logging games, making highlights. So. A lot of the highlights that people would watch on Inside the NBA, I would put those highlights together. Uh, eventually, you know, met people within the organization. I got uh, moved up to Kenny's picks. So anytime you see Kenny go into the board, I used to put those picks together. And it was cool working with Kenny because, you know, he, uh, he valued me. He trusted my opinion. So a lot of times he would ask me what I would see and he would go with it. Or if he didn't, you know, he would think of something else. And um, I was able to, to learn a lot just from uh, talking basketball with him. And it was always cool to see, you know, some of my work up there that he would talk about and everything. So that was a great experience for me. Oh, that's so cool. What a great path. And, uh, you know, you're on your way now and uh, NBA champion. Uh, JB, I cannot thank you enough for sharing uh, your passion and knowledge with us. Just tremendous to be able to hear you talk about the game. Uh, no problem. I enjoyed it, man. We have to do it again sometime soon. <laughs>